Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges, and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Scott Luton and my dear friend Jenny Froome here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Jenny, how are you doing? Doing very, very well. Thanks, Scott. Feeling like I'm running towards Christmas already, but <laughs> still doing well. Well, and hey, we're lucky today. This is my second conversation with you today. So we're <laughs> we're feeling like a million dollars. And as uh, you know, Jenny, I love these Jenny and friends episodes we got here. It all makes up our continuing our long running supply chain leadership across Africa series in conjunction with a whole bunch of friends. Jenny, we're going to have to give you some clones given all the roles you play. Uh, some of our listeners and, and viewers may, uh, may remember your director of the Africa supply chain excellence awards, co-chair of the Africa supply chain in action. You've been recognized as one of the top 100 women in supply chain in Africa a few months back. Very proud of that. And course, part of the leadership team for the long running and successful SAPIX annual conference in South Africa. 45 years, I think. Jenny, is that right? Yep. This year will be the 45th. And I think it's horrifically the 27th one that I've managed, but the 25th in person. Wow. So it's a, it's a big milestone and it's very exciting. Well, as always, thank you for what you do. Uh, blessed are the connectors out across the, the, the global industry that bring people together. For so we can push industry forward, we can push networks forward, we can push individual success forward, and it takes people like you. So Jenny, we, you know, you know, I'm the co-chair of the Atlanta uh, Jenny Froome Fan Club. So, <laughs> all right, but you. Jenny, you've brought two wonderful friends here today: leaders, professionals, interesting personalities, and more. I want to go ahead and welcome in uh, both of our guests. So up first, we've got a podcast host, procurement professional, supply chain enthusiast who is passionate about being a voice and advocate for the development of the African supply chain. Please join me in welcoming Stella Shaketa. Stella, how are you doing? I'm great, Scott. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jenny, as well, for having me. I'm super excited. Well, we are too. We are too. And joining Stella today, uh, we have the founder, owner, and executive consultant of KPI Cubed Supply Chain Consulting and Training. She brings more than 20 years of experience doing big things in the industry, Please join me in welcoming Karen Praturius. Karen, how you doing? Hey, Scott. Very well, thanks. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here with Stella and with Jenny and with you. Stella and I talk weekly, so this will take place of our weekly chat. So very excited <laughs> to be here together. Well, Karen, uh, we understand about those uh, those weekly discussions and the power of those, and we're going to dive into those a little later in today's conversation. So thanks so much, Stella and Karen, for joining us. So Jenny, I understand we did, we did some homework, some due diligence, some market intel gathering before today's show. And Stella, starting with you, we understand that you created a, fa back in university, you created a fashion show that benefited charity. And a lot of folks don't know that. So tell us, tell us that story. Yeah, um, I was part of a society, which is like a club, for example, for students, right, in university yeah. to join in. It was a Christian society and uh, we wanted to, we, we yearly we would create a fashion show. So it was my first time being head of creative arts with a friend of mine. We managed to organize a whole fashion show that had like 600 people in attendance and let me tell you the logistics of it <laughs> it was impressive out of this world because you had to manage models you had to manage um artists you had to manage the designers in itself it was such a logistics but at the end of the day when we had the whole show when we gather everyone around it was such an amazing experience because it was all worth it it was for kids which had underprivileged kids in orphans mm. so at the end of the day it was all worth it the stress i remember once i like i cried because mm. <laughs> everything was just going wrong <laughs> but, but you persevered it all worked out Right. Yeah, I persevered. <laughs> and it's for a great cause. And we're going to have to dive into a separate episode about the parallels between uh, the high industry of fashion and supply chain. Because mm -hmm. it sounds like there's lots yeah. of common themes there. But there uh, hey, is. 
Uh, Stella, I really appreciate um, what I'm picking up, kind of a passion for giving back and giving forward, as we call it here. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Jenny, your quick comment before I move on to Karin and some uh, book reading. Yeah, Stella's preaching to the converted here. Event management of any nature is stressful right. and often causes tears. So well done. And underappreciated. <laughs> Frankly, underappreciated yeah. as we've all been in that space. Uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. bless again, bless are those that help connect uh, others and, and help uh, fuel um, support for those in need. In your case, tell us. Thanks so much. Uh, all right, Karen, we were, I was like writing down a book list of things I got to <laughs> check out in the pre show. We understand, again, a little market intel gathering. You're really big into obscure books, uh, primarily fiction. You were dropping some titles. Tell us more about that. Yeah, uh, Scott, I really enjoy reading um, and especially reading for fun. I read a lot for work and for other purposes. So I allow myself to get some read, reading in for relaxation purposes. At the moment, I'm reading the original Agatha Christie collection, a work of fiction. Agatha Christie, of course, very well known for mysteries and, of course, one of the first female writers. Books mostly published around about 1920s, thereabouts. Um, wow. 100 years ago. Uh, very interesting to read those books. And what I find is that nothing has changed. <laughs> the problems that we have in the world are the same. Uh, in the one book that I'm just reading, the key character's hotel room was broken into. We still have that. Uh, it's just the technology that is a little bit different. There's still fraud, there's still corruption, there's still murder and maim. Mm. Um, and to see the world through different eyes, I think also gives a fresh view for oneself and to put things into perspective. So I really enjoy that. Oh, mm -hmm. Karn, man, we could really, and both of y'all, this is going to be a great conversation. There's so much comment on there. Jenny, uh, uh, what? pull something out of what Karn just shared. I think y'all also... Uh, share that um, kindred spirits and, and and voracious readers, if I use that phrase, that word right. Jenny, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I've I've known Corin for a very very long time, and every conversation I have with her, I learn something new. So there's there's I'm very excited for for the ongoing conversation we're going to have here because I'm going to learn lots of new stuff. Oh man! Well, let me just double check. Voracious appetite and voracious reading. Did I use that phrase right? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Uh, our <laughs> listeners know we create words all the time here, and usually it's my fault. So, all right, Jenny. So, where are we going next with our two esteemed guests here? Well, we're going to find out what they are currently doing in their professional careers, um, and I think that there's some exciting stuff. And I think that you're both going to have to work out the salient bits to share with us because you both do so much. So let's start with with Stella and you tell us what you are, what it is that you're doing currently. Yes, thank you, Jenny. Um, so currently I'm actually working in an oil and gas company here in Mozambique um, as a contracts engineer. Uh, part of the contracts and procurement departments where basically assisting with all the procurement process like from requisition to award um basically also my roles have been in that area of procurement and i've also been funny enough i've worked in a recruitment company mm -hmm. <laughs> during my time uh and now also i'm doing as the podcast host for yasp which is your african supply chain podcast so talking about everything concerning african supply chains and we're going to talk mm -hmm. a lot more about that uh in a moment and jenny right before you move on to karen just to paint a picture, we were talking kind of pre-show about um, how as advanced as uh, geographic technology has come, a lot of us are still geographic, geographically challenged. So when, when Stella says Mozambique, that's on the east side, uh, the southern eastern side of the African continent. And think about where Madagascar, the island is. It's, it's directly across um, uh, a body of water, I guess I'll call it, uh, from Mozambique. <laughs> yes. That kind of helps folks. Uh, uh, paint a picture there. So, Jenny, uh, that's a great start. We're moving to uh, Karen next, huh? Yep. Karen, just, just dazzle us now. <laughs> <laughs> um, normally when people talk to me, they say, how do you do it all? And then I say, I also don't know. So <laughs> at the moment, uh, I've got my own business, KPIQ, Supply Chain Consulting and Training, and we just celebrated 
on the 13th of April being in business for eight years as a small business. It's very exciting to actually have survived for such a long time, especially when we had the challenges of the multiple years of COVID. In that same time, we had some uh, riots in South Africa that disrupted our supply chains. And shortly thereafter, we had some severe flooding that disrupted our supply chains even more. And uh, I did the millennial thing on LinkedIn and I congratulated me for being in business for eight years, along with my business partner, also is my husband and my rock, and we do a lot of things together. Um, we're working on some exciting projects in the RFID space at the moment. We are working on a project where we are taking uh, implementation of warehouse management systems to the next level in a homeware fashion group from where they normally do straightforward fashion. Homeware is a little bit different, things that you need to look at there. Um, we're working on a long-term project with a 3PL on improving processes and looking at these systems and creating a single platform. And on the side of that, I'm a volunteer board member for SAPEX that takes up a lot of my time. And I train the CECP, that's the Certified Supply Chain chain a professional from ACSM and that keeps me busy on Saturdays we have got a group that comes to classes face to face we also have some hybrid students and, and you got to love supply chain if you come to class, learn about supply chain on Saturdays, right? On a Saturday. You've got to love it. And who loves it even more is my group of self-study students where we do group support classes on Tuesday and Thursday evenings to keep them straightforward or straight um, and honest and being on on the right path with their studies. Um, and then on the sideline of that, uh, I am studying further in sustainability. I just completed the ACSM, Building Sustainable Supply Chains, now in April. And in March, I completed the ICS Certified Sustainability Supply Chain Auditor course. I'm writing my exam for that soon, hopefully on the 26th of April. Um, and on the side of that, I'm a wife and a mother and a daughter and a pet owner. And I really keep my life quite busy and, as wow. Scott said, a voracious reader. Man, okay. So Stella and Karen and Jenny, man, goodness gracious, all of y'all need more clones. You just need more clones. How are we all, all done? <laughs> yeah, Jenny. and then I forgot to say, and I meant to Stella on the side of that. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I bet. I want a, to get to Karen's level. There you go, Stella. <laughs> well, you know, I bet. We're going to talk more about mentorship in a minute, but I bet that's a healthy two-way street where y'all both yeah. are learning a lot about um, about things in your blind spot. So Jenny, before I move into uh, the whys of some of these things that both Stella and Karen have both shared, your your um, your take on these full lives that both Stella and Karen lead. Well, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted, <laughs> and I'm I'm inspired, and you know, I I, I constantly, continually. Uh, I'm grateful to Supply Chain Now for giving us this opportunity to be able to highlight the talent and the knowledge and the jolly hardworking people that we have got. I know they're all around the world, but it's lovely to be able to be given the opportunity to highlight African supply mm. chain professionals who, who bring so much all the time. Mm. Well said, 100%, uh, Jenny, and we're honored to do it. It's been, it has been a gift. It's, it's, it's given us so much as well. Uh, these are some of my favorite conversations. So, Stella, I, I want to move into the whys of some things that y'all both shared. And I want to start, though, I want to start by correcting me earlier. I said that body of water between Mozambique and Madagascar, that is actually the Mozambique Channel. Uh, I got that right, Stella? Mozambique Channel? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I like, I'm a big geography nerd as well. I love zooming in. <laughs> Google's been such a great uh, great tool there. Let's go to your podcast series, your African Supply Chain Podcast, which I bet, as all of us podcast producers say, you can get wherever you get your podcast from. So y'all check that out. Um, why? Start with a why. Why did you start that podcast, uh, podcast series? Yeah, um, Scott, it really birthed out of the idea of finding my tribe of finding people who have similar passions uh, and interests as me, because I love this industry. I remember back in 2014, when I chose this course, it was like, why, why are you doing supply chain? Because I constantly had to explain to people, supply chain is, 
Right, right. <laughs> so uh, it really, for me, since then, and even when I concluded my studies, I did my master's in supply chain, it just really sparked this fire and passion for this industry. Even coming back to Mozambique to come and work to this side, it really sparked this, continue to spark this action. And I can't, I can't continue and say that what really happened unless I tell the story of how it really happened. Okay. Um, because it's, I went to Karen, well, um, because I wanted to do a course on, I wanted to get a supply chain certification. And we had a conversation, we talked, and back then I couldn't continue because I didn't have the finances to continue with it, but we still kept in touch. And then thereafter, I gathered, I had like a group of friends who also had a, a passion for supply chain, who were working in the industry for a couple of time, for a couple of some years. So we went to Karen for really advice because we wanted to start an association for supply chain here in Mozambique. And Karen really like highlighted things that we were like not aware of, you know, of starting an association, of the costs involved, of the, the highlights involved. So she really brought down, broke down to us what really goes on in, in terms of creating an association. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we didn't continue with the idea of association and the group kind of scattered. Right. So I still continued with Karen and I was like, Karen, I want to continue with something. I want to do something that is mine, um, that uh, brings joy to me. And I love supply chain. So we really started to debate with this idea, playing the, with the idea of podcasting. And really, it was not in my mind back then, but she challenged me to, okay, you should start a podcast. You should talk, find your tribe, you know, and it really for me, it really started like that. I'm like, let me just try to find my tribe. Let me find people who are with similar interests. And I started to contact people just like that, like through LinkedIn, really <laughs> getting guests. And the more I did it, the first episode was like thrilling. And the feedback that I got, I was like, oh, okay, maybe I should continue the, doing this. And the why really is... I want to become an expert in mm. this industry. I want to become a thought leader. And what a better way to do it than to be and asking those who have walked that, that path, who are walking that path and who know it, to tell it to me and to my audience how we can do it and how we can survive as mm. supply chain professionals. So, yeah. Love that. I love that. All right. So I got to ask, um, give us a, a gem or two that you've really enjoyed from those conversations you're having on your African supply chain podcast? One of the things that I, I love it is how with all of the guests is education and knowledge because supply chain is consistently changing. And if we don't have the education and knowledge that we need it in order to keep up with the pace of the industry, we're not gonna, we're not going to survive because like 10 years ago, the information available is not, a, is not the one that is applicable today. And one of my guests actually highlighted in terms of how culture impacts supply chains. Um, for example, with Netflix, how before like five years ago, Go, you wouldn't find a lot of content in terms of African African content creators, mm. but now you can go on link uh, on Netflix and you'll find that a lot of African content creators, movies, series. So we can see a lot of companies adapting to that. So that's what's that's one of the things that highlighted to me and opened my eyes. I can say in terms of wow, um, we are so diverse. Even if people are in the U.S., if people are in Europe, we can connect into something. Thing. We can connect into those little factors in terms of culture, in terms yes. of growing in this field and connecting with this passion. So that's one of the things that I can say I've learned from my guests. And, and we're going to have to connect if we're going to move the industry forward and tackle some of the old and new challenges that uh, we've all been faced with in, you know, and for a millennium, but certainly in recent years. Jenny, get your, um, uh, what comes to mind as, as Stella really unpacked that, uh, the genesis of her podcast, uh, and and those gems that are coming out of of the of a growing digital media uh, platform. Your mm -hmm. thoughts, Jenny? Uh, just immediately struck by, as always, how wonderful it is to meet young supply chain professionals who have a vision, who have the commitment to push themselves forward. But more importantly, you know, you're the future of this profession. And to hear it being spoken about with such eloquence and such passion is just 
really, really inspiring and and reassuring. Yes. You know, really reassuring. So th- thank you, Stella. Yes, absolutely. Jenny, 100% echo what you just shared there. Um, all right. So switching gears, Karin. Uh, as we, as you, I think you uh, alluded to on the front end, you volunteered extensively in your career. Uh, you mentioned the SAPIX uh, volunteerism you've done for 18 years now. You were recently elected as a director on the board in uh, 2022. So what what is your why for doing all that? Scott, I want to be sure that there's still a supply chain that can be run. Uh at the moment, things are moving so fast and we're all aware of the sustainability issues that faces us. But at the heart of this, there are us, the people of the planet. There is nothing else. There's no one coming. There's no uh, knight on a white horse like Don Quixote coming for us to try and save us. And it's up to us who work in supply chains to ensure that the knowledge is there and the knowledge is passed on. And I think especially in Africa, there's been challenges with passing on knowledge and access to information. And I want to make sure that people who enter the profession don't have to face the same hardships that I had in trying to figure out everything. The wheel is there. We just have to make it turn. And for me, sharing information and sharing my knowledge and working with people to make sure that there is the next generation that can take over when we are no longer in the position or able to be there, that's for me is important. I want to share the knowledge. And I think that's one of my key drivers. And Jenny knows I like to talk a lot, um, sometimes too much. But that's how I, I give expression and I share my passion. And I think with supply chains, every day there's something new in supply chains. Um, there's small supply chains and there's large supply chains. When you go to your local hairdresser who works from her home, she's got a supply chain. When you go to one of the international chains, they've got a supply chain. In the news in South Africa over the last few weeks, there's been the incredible, fantastic almost story of a serial murderer or serial rapist and serial and murder, convicted murderer who escaped from prison by faking his own death and setting a body alight in his cell. And I'm using that as a case study in my supply chain classes about how all of the supply chains come together, even when we think prisons, wow. there are things to consider. Um, and all of the, the points of failure that had to go wrong for that magical story to come together, where eight months later, the guy has been arrested in Tanzania and brought back and is facing his charges again. So supply chains are everywhere. And that's the exciting part for me is that you can't look at anything, even if we had to go and live on Mars one day um, and we eat pills, Instead of food, someone had to create that button on the spaceship right. that could produce the pill and the ingredients for that pill so we can stay alive. And that for me is the exciting part. Is I never studied supply chain to start off with. I studied a lot of other things and I ended up in my career later on and that through training and systems. And supply chains are just everywhere. You can't mm. look around without facing a new supply chain every day. All right. Karen, you, um, I got to go back to that whole prisoner mm-hmm. Uh, faking his own death with his body. That's a whole new lesson in provenance, if, if, I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll have to, we'll have to visit that down the road a bit. Um, all right, so Jenny, uh, your thoughts on what uh, uh, Karin just shared there, and then we are moving back to Stella and Mozambique. So your, your thoughts, Jenny. Yeah, I, I always love it when people highlight the people part, um, and, and that is something that doesn't get highlighted enough because we're all about digitization and AI and technology and all the widgets and gadgets and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, the the back the background is is people. It's us. It's the community. And you know that's something that I've always respected with Karen is that whole belief in the value of community. And it's what you know. It's your background as well, Scott. It's something that we have built during COVID was a great community and and it's the essence of all of it really yeah well so well um, said yeah it really is and, and i love that the essence of all of it that that's certainly um i believe that i feel that in my bones uh your comment there uh jenny um mm-hmm. okay so where we're going next with stella and karen 
Well, we're going to find out from from Stella a little bit about about Mozambique. It's not uh, for uh, you know for those of you who don't know very much about Mozambique. It's a complex country. I've never been. I've always wanted to go. And it's not just the vision of beautiful beaches and wonderful deep sea um, diving and all the mag- magic that a coastal country has got. There are. It, challenges, right, Stella? And and from a supply chain perspective, what sort of things share with us some of the the day-to-day challenges that supply chain professionals face in your country? Yes, um, Jenny, there's a lot of challenges that there's the beauty and but also there's like the thorns, right? And among the roses. Uh, one mm-hmm. of the challenges that we really face is the whole distribution process and scaling up because we, we well you have suppliers they are how can i say it's fragmented you have suppliers that don't know each other you know they might have the product but they don't know each other and how they can connect and how they can meet up to connect each other right and also that kind of is challenging in terms of getting the transport of trusting your supplier um Apart from that, there's also permits and insurances clauses, which also scales it up. It's tremendous, especially for small, medium enterprises. Informal market, it's at an all-time high. I think it's like yeah. 70%, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the formal, informal market predominates the, the 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 market and makes it challenging as well in terms of access to the information for supply chain professionals. And, and I think one of the things that is not really talked about, but I feel like it is a challenge, is the recognition that we do not, as supply chain professional, we don't have the visibility. Well, supply chain here is still gaining ascendance. So you will probably hear people, jobs, if you hear the jobs, it's like procurement, logistics, or procurement, or logistics. <laughs> it's not Really, <laughs> you don't have other than that, or you just have someone who says uh, a position for supply chain manager, but re- really it's a logistics professionals that they're looking for. So there is the recognition is still not there. And that also comes with the training and education in that sense. Um, because even up until now, I even had a test, I, I did a test. I'm like, I went to a local library. Let me just try to find a books on supply chain that in Portuguese. I found none. Uh, it was really, it, it really broke my heart in terms of that because there's so much information in supply chain, but it's available out there. And if you're not deliberate in getting that information, you won't get access to it. And I think if um, one of the challenges that we as supply chain professionals here in Mozambique that we are now doing, it's getting the information, getting the education, getting the knowledge, getting certified. Because otherwise, if you depend in the company or if we depend for the information to be thrown at us, that just doesn't happen. So those are some of the challenges that I really saw that as supply chain professionals we are facing and that we are fighting constantly every day. Yeah, great, great observations. Um, and I think, and I think it's you know, yes, it's it's specific to you, and also you've got the language, um, the the language constraints as well. Um, but but it is also something that I think we're, we're all familiar with with these problems and these challenges. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Exactly. It's something that I also found it a little bit in South Africa in terms of the information. I remember I did a, a, a study in physical distribution countries in, in physical distribution challenges in emerging African countries. And guess what? Information was also missing. So mm-hmm. you might find it a lot of information in terms of the big the big emerging companies like Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Kenya. You will find the information there. But yeah. now when you come to the ones that are still not yet there, they're still fighting, you won't find that much information. And for me, that's a passion. It really sparks that passion within me to, hey, I need to make information available. That's why I even started the podcast to, hey, guys, there's things happening in other African countries, you know, <laughs> that um, there's challenges everywhere. Some are nuanced. But we are overcoming. There's great stories out there of companies, of individuals who are really doing what they need to do in order to overcome it. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I think it's obvious the, the, the answer to my next question is what inspires you to be a supply chain professional? I mean, really just every day and the air you breathe inspires you, it sounds like to me. <laughs> right. Well, and then and yeah. I got to add, it, it is refreshing, going, you know, going, uh, invigorating, and, and refreshing, reassuring, you name it. The, the uh, passion with which, you know, you, you're talking about it, Stella. Sure, there's plenty of problems. There's plenty of challenges, right? Yeah. But there are folks that um, are putting boots on the ground, taking action to do something about it that not only, again, improves the industry, no matter where, what geographical location, but yeah. opens the doors, which you're speaking to, Stella, for opportunities for others, that dissemination of information. Because, hey, bless are those folks do that too. Um, all right. So, Jenny, man. We're going to need, uh, so to our producer friends, we're going to need three more hours a day. Uh, there's so much to get into <laughs> with Stella, Jenny, and Karen. Uh, Jenny, where are we going next? We're going to ask Karen, really. But, you know, again, I think that that in the, in the context of our conversation, we've, we've we felt it uh, that, you know, but let's ask the question, what keeps you inspired about being a supply chain professional? I think it's the last word. It's the professional in supply chain. Uh, I don't want to do anything that's mediocre or just a me too or like someone else. I've got incredible drive. Maybe it's the Gen X's inside of us like we <laughs> spoke about at the start. Um, you know, if I do something, I have to be, uh, the, I want to say the best at it. I'm striving to be there. I'm not always the best at everything that I attempt. Um, but I want to get that into the hearts and minds of young people in supply chain and, and actually everyone working in supply chain that this is a profession. This is something that you do as a professional. We spoke about where's Mozambique and the Mozambican channel in Madagascar. And I encourage my students and I say, when you read something, when you listen uh, to something on the radio, when you watch a movie, go to Google Maps, go and see where that city is, in which continent is it, in which country is it, what's the closest port, are there train stations, are there airports, how do they get their goods there? Because uh, it affects all of us. We need to understand this environment that we are in and we need to understand that the supply chain is also that. It is a challenge. It's an area of uh, lots of things coming together. And for me, it's just so exciting to think about all of these different areas and how we can get to know more about it and make things better. I've got also that internal strive for always continuous improving and seeing how can we change things? If we do this, how can we do it better? And, and that links for me back also to resources and, and sustainability again, which are some of my other passions. Um, and that's what keeps me going in this industry is that there's so much to learn and so much to share. And let's turn ourselves into the professionals in supply chain. It's not just for other industries that professionals are there. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to work on ourselves to get to that level and to get to the next level of supply chain professionals. Yeah, well said. That's brilliant. And we go we go back always to the the fact that COVID, probably the only silver lining out of all of it, was was the fact that supply chain management is better understood we've still got a long way to go but um but but Karen what keeps you awake at night other than reading old books <laughs> old books yeah um I must I must mention this um when I first studied cartography, I had a bursary for that. And then after that, straight away, I wanted to study astronomy and applied mathematics. And uh, I never got to do that because my mother said, if you read a book, you may as well write a test about it. So that's one of my mottos in life. And then if you're going to write a test about something, you may as well get paid for that knowledge. So then I changed my majors and started studying into systems analytics and information systems and programming and that kind of thing. Um, later on, supply chain came. Um, so with that, what keeps me awake at night is absolutely sustainability. I know it sounds like boring, everyone's talking about it, but as I said earlier, we are the people of the planet. There is nothing else. Um, a few years back, I watched a Cowspiracy and Kiss the Ground and those kinds of documentaries and I stopped eating meat. And I watched Seaspiracy and all of those and I stopped eating fish. 
And then I watched dead white man's clothes and I cried for a week because I can't stop wearing clothes. But what do we do now with those problems? Where do we go? We have to find solutions for these things because it affects all of us. Here in South Africa, we've got tremendous problems with the power grids and everyone is putting up solar panels on their roofs of their houses and everyone has got an inverter. Well, so everyone that can afford it has got an inverter that has either a lead acid motor battery what is that doing to the environment? Those who can afford it has got lithium batteries because it lasts longer. What's that doing to the environment? What are those photo panels doing, the solar panels on the roof of your house? Who's thought about and who's planning for the reverse supply chains of those panels when they stop working after 15 or 20 years? Because my child is still growing up. I'm a pensioner mom. My son is 16 and I'm 51. So I have to think about things that will enable an earth and environment solutions for him and his children in 15 or 20 years time, because those solutions are not there. Right. And we are focusing so much on other things that we're not getting back to original first principle thinking of solving the actual problem. Uh, back to the, for example, the, the solar panels. Right. Instead of getting to using less electricity, we're just getting to what alternative electricity can we use? And that for me is not the right answer. We need to get to the innovation of what can make us use less energy and less electricity. Does that mean I want to sit in the dark at night to save electricity? No. <laughs> no. Do I want to burn a candle? No. Do I want to make fire with wood? No, because that's releasing all kinds of greenhouse gases and that's bad for the environment. And, <laughs> you know, you get almost into an in, 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 infinity loop when right. you start worrying about those things. But that for me is that we, we have to collectively start focusing our energies on to see how we're going to solve those problems. We can't just find alternatives because those are just substitutes. Karin, uh, you pointed out the lithium batteries, of course, uh, globally, the, the push is on, the movement is on, whatever you want to call it, the revolution for all things EV or electron, uh, mm -hmm. electric vehicles. But you, po you rightly point out, we're going to have some really big challenges, growing challenges in our hand with the, with the infrastructure and the supply chains behind these EVs that, that probably, and I, we're all consumers here, right? Many consumers, maybe that have the, the few that are late to the party that haven't made, you know, connect the dots behind the supply chains behind certain products. So they feel good about, hey, we're buying this, it's an EV, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it all comes with tremendous challenges. And we, we to your point, we're going to recognize that. And more importantly, do something about it. Get the root cause, right? All right. Gosh, Jenny, um, I'll get your quick comment here, and then I'm going to shift gears out of, the out of the necessity for time because I want to talk mentorship with both of our guests. Jenny, yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, just very quickly, I was just going to go back to Lorraine Jenks, who we had the privilege of, of chatting to, who's been kept awake at night for since the 1960s, worrying about sustainability and the issues and everything else. And your point, Karen, about stop scratching the surface, we have to actually educate, discuss, but think about the repercussions of the solutions. Um, very, very real food for thought. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, you got to dive beyond the headlines, right? Got to got to think holistically and critically about the, the challenges of our day and look past the, some of the feel good stuff, as we're we're kind of alluding to. Uh, all right, enough uh, about that for now, Scott. Man, I can go down a tangent and for for days it feels like, but but really, Stella, Karn, and and Jenny, I really appreciate what you're all sharing here today. So let's talk men mentorship, uh, Stella. You are also passionate about mentorship. So why do you think? that um, mentorship is so important, especially to, to everybody probably, but young professionals too. Your thoughts? Yes, uh, Scott, for me, mentorship really helps you to fast grow your career. As Karen was saying, there's certain things that she did during her path, during her journey, mistakes that she had made, victories that she had won, that she now wants to share. And I don't have to. If I have a mentor, I don't have to make the same mistakes that Karen did 
because now I'm learning from her. And I'm the type of person where I like to learn from other people. I like to learn their experiences. I like to learn what, what were their victories? What were their successes? What, what were the key success factors, I can say? And mentorship allows you to have that. As a young professional, you're starting off. You are really don't know how the industry really works. You don't know who the bad guys are <laughs> <laughs> or what the potholes to avoid. So having a mentor allows you to that, to fast track that you don't have, they will tell you, okay, you know, this, don't stop here. Don't, don't do this. Look out, look out for this. Oh, I think you should consider this. Or I think you should consider that. So a mentor allows you, it gives you that um, wider view, I can say. And another thing is that it gives you another perspective. I remember I had a section with Karen because I got a job offer. And she really helped me to break it down, what really that entails. She really helped me to look at advantages, the disadvantages, and not in a way that persuade me to take it or not, but to really look at the full picture, you know, because sometimes as a young professional, you might be tempted to just take the next thing or just to take a quick buck, you know, or the easy way out. And having a mentor like Karen, it allowed me to really see the full picture and to really sit down and analyze. Mm. So your mentor gives you that another perspective, another voice, because again, they've walked the path. They have seen many people make the same mistake or even taking another route, which did not work out for them. And finally, mentorship allows you to be challenged. I was challenged during this time. Because I remember I had to do homework. <laughs> I had and to do homework. Everybody hates homework, right? I, I know. I, used to. <laughs> I had to do homework, but again, is that taking out of, taking you out of that comfort zone? Because sometimes you get so comfortable. If you find, uh, as a young professional, sometimes if you're if you find a good job, you you are very prone to just relax. But mentorship allows you to be challenged. What's the next thing? What are you gonna do about it? You know, you have this talent, you have this passion. What are you gonna do about it? So a mentor allows you to spark, to I can say stir up the things that are inside of you. So I think those three things are really what all young professionals should strive for in a mentor. Oh, gosh. All right. So, so much there you shared. But, you know, <laughs> um, r- really two two thoughts come to my mind, uh, Jenny. Number one, the true super superhero skills that mentors bring to the table. You know, you, you see things differently. You hear things differently. You perceive and think things differently. You, you, uh, you shine a big, bright um, spotlight in your blind spot that we all have. That's the power of mentors. But the second thought, Jenny, comes to my mind and hearing Stella talk about this is – we got to fight back that that natural human uh, resistance to change and resistance to feedback. We got we got to actively manage that to to make the most out of these mentoring relationships, right? Jenny, your thoughts, and then I'm gonna switch gears over to uh, Karen. Yeah, I I just wish that you know I had had the opportunity of a mentor and that I had identified a career and that I'd had that sort of guidance. Um, But then again, you know, well done, Stella, for listening to the advice. There are so many people who get given advice and still decide that they're going to make the same mistake because they can only learn from their own mistakes, not from other people's. So, you know, I I think it's being selective and using the information and advice. And that that takes that takes talent. I would add it takes talent. It takes maturity. It takes humility. Right, yeah. uh, and if you yeah. if you can really focus on those things, man, mentors can take you miles and miles faster, mm-hmm. no. further. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, Karin, uh, let's talk. Uh, so you, I know you've spoken previously about the intercultural, intergenerational mentorship that uh, that's been developed with your relationship with Stella. So tell us more about what you've learned there and why why is this all important to you? Okay. Yeah, it was a magical journey, actually, with Stella. We've been walking this route now for, I think, about eight or nine months, eh, Stella? It feels like it's yesterday, but it's been a long time. And what's important about mentorship is that it works both ways. Uh, you have to be open for also your mentee to be able to challenge you because I grew up in a world that is much different from what Stella was growing up in. Um, I'm a white woman 
in my 50s, well, 51, in South Africa, which is a fairly developed country. Still, I was half my age and grew up in a developing country with its own sets of challenges uh, challenges, and different experiences. Where I am also in my life stage is nowhere near where Stella is. And I have to also be able to embrace what she is looking after and what she wants to do. And I can't allow myself because I'm a mentor to try and live my life vicariously through her. I have to be sure that if she comes with a question, I can guide her, I can show her a path, and I can enable her to make the right kind of decision without influencing her on what the decision should be, because it's not my decision. It is still hers. And we have to look at it from that side. When we also started the podcast and the um inclination of the young to do things quickly. I remember when Stella first decided on the podcast, she was like, okay, and let's record our first session next week and you're going to be my first guest. <laughs> <laughs> and it was literally like, like that. And I said, Stella, let's just slow down. We want to do this fast. We don't want to be troubled by all of the necessarily bells and whistles. And you don't have to have that to get your voice out there. Right. But let's think about this. You have to actually go and do a little bit of homework. You have to go and do a bit of a script. You have to do a bit of research. I can't come in cold and have a conversation with you for an hour. We have to test our technology. We have to make sure that this is working and how will it work. And in the end, it took, instead of a week, I think, Stella, it was then a month before you then yeah. settled on the first <laughs> guest when yes. you started doing the homework. But that is where the openness needs to come in and from both sides. And as Stella said, you must be able to also take the advice from someone else. And as the mentor, you have to realize that you can give advice, but it's the mentee's decision whether to take it. You mustn't now try and impress that upon them. Mm. It's important to also take the feedback from them to say, well, I have considered it and I am not in favor of this, what you have suggested. And they are still allowed to go their own way. So Stella and I together learned a lot about ourselves in our conversations. Sometimes we just had a conversation and we didn't have a specific topic that we wanted to solve because not everything is a problem. Not everything needs to right. be solved. And Stella also went through a, a, an area where she was a little bit uh, rejected, feeling rejected from the podcast, not getting enough viewers immediately, not getting enough listeners. And we all, and we all go through <laughs> that, of course. We all go through that. Right? Yeah. And we said, okay, now it's time then to recoup and to regenerate and reflect on what you've achieved and give yourself the rest because we also live in a world that is now so busy that we are not allowed to take rest. It's frowned upon when you take rest. And then yeah. we worked together and Stella took some time off and decided what she wants to do and how she wants to position it. And I also had to hold back from my side to not say, I'm going to pressure you into a weekly session when you are not ready for it. Sometimes you need to allow for that. And I think that was the beauty from, from our relationship over this last almost nine months. From, from the time that we started and the time that Stella launched the podcast was about three months in total from when you had your first episode. So there was a lot of hard work that went into it to become the overnight success of the YAS podcast. Mm. But there was a lot of work in the background that, of course, most viewers and listeners will not see. And it's fantastic to work along that. And Salah could also call me out about where I had my blinkers on from right. the biases that I have in the world that I live in. And that we had together work and see how does it work in your area? How does it work in my area? Where can we find where the roads come together? Where can we merge and find something that works for both of us or that works for her that works for me there's a lot of reverse mentoring going on as well and i think a lot of mentors sometimes neglect to yes. ensure that they also have mentors from different generations or from different cultural backgrounds or different languages that you have to work with and that you can understand um, and in africa it's very important to realize that we are all esl in south africa or in africa mostly which is english second language right there are Me very too, few by the places. Way. Me too. I'm, I'm ESL too. here. Yeah. So, just so you all know. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, so you don't have to get everything right every single time because it is not your home language. It is not your first language. But the knowledge out there 
is a lot in it. And I always encourage Stella, and she actually did a post recently in Portuguese, and I went, yay, fantastic. You need to do more of that because we also need to preserve our languages as part of sustainability for yeah. those who come after us, especially the technical language. It's easy to switch back to English where everything is already documented. It's hard work to take your home language where the technical vocabulary does not exist right. and to put it in there. But now I'm preaching. Yeah. That's not what it's about. But that's <laughs> well. the exciting journey is to see, oh, Stella, yeah. how about you do something in a different language? How mm. about you challenge yourself? <laughs> um, and from my side as well, and I think that's where we really gelled and we came together and we realized what does it really mean to be working together in, in this kind of situation? Mm. Sometimes it's a fun chat and sometimes it's a moan session and we want some sympathy, but mostly yeah. we have to put in the work to get something done. Yes, exactly. do the work, do the work, do the work. That was a piece of advice that one of our guests uh, told us a couple of years ago that that's always stuck with me. Um, there's no shortcuts, um, very very few shortcuts. Um, okay, so I want to give, give Stella a chance to respond. And then, Jenny, I'm going to get your take on, what we, on, on all the goodness that uh, Karin just shared there. Um, but before I do, I want to just point out something that Karin said. You know, we've all seen that meme of the iceberg and how we all see the, the first, you know, 10 feet or 100 feet. But none of us really see the thousands of feet below surface level. And that's yeah. so true, whether it's digital media you know, or if it's new risk-taking uh, ventures, if it's supply chain, doing new things anywhere. You know, folks don't understand a lot of times the struggle that is behind even the smallest bits of success. So, uh, so Stella, uh, Karen just shared a lot there about clearly a relationship that she highly values uh, with what you said earlier. Y'all both, it's a, it's, uh, y'all have uh, both gained so much, it seems like, from y'all's relationship, your comments on what she shared, and I'm going to get Jenny's as well. Yeah, um, for me, the whole relationship, I loved it because it was so natural, you know, even though we are from different culture, one thing that really bound us was the passion for supply chain and the passion for this industry and to grow. For me, all of my sessions with Karen, I went with my pen and paper literally every time. <laughs> because <laughs> didn't want to miss a thing. Yeah, I did not because even now I'm I was like, okay, I sh I should write down some things that Karen is saying. Because every time that she would share something, she would share an idea. Um, I might I wouldn't I might not per se take it at that moment. For example, she has been pushing me for TikTok. <laughs> for me, social media, it's a work. And I have to sit down and like actually research. But it's that sometimes you don't take it immediately, the advice, but you come around, you know, because you understand the importance and why, and why your mentor is saying what they are saying. Mm. And it's that part of understanding of, okay, if they're saying this is, it's probably, most probably, 100% for my good. You know, they don't want to hinder us at the end of the day. They want us to see grow. And one of the things that I've I've seen also with uh, Karen, how not only has she been a mentor, but also a sponsor. And in terms of pushing me, you know, to, to get that visibility, to get that voice, you know, with her connections, with even introducing me to Jenny, you know, Jenny has also been a sponsor because in life you can have mentors, but also sponsors, they take you to another level that you, you wouldn't get there if they were not there already. So yes. um, it's being open to that relationship. You don't know where it will take you at the end of the day. Be open, learn, and you just might find yourself at the top just like that. <laughs> All right, so Jenny, I'm gonna get you, but I want to point something out that Stella shared there. And look, I'm very optimistic, but we got to keep it real. Stella, Stella shared that eventually everyone will come around. Unfortunately, there's some folks that won't ever come around. Right? It takes a bright, <laughs> self-aware, intelligent, yeah. motivated, uh, perseverant, passionate individuals like Stella that realize the value and walk through that door. So Stella. Uh, I, I love y'all. Y'all should write a book eventually together about um, yeah. about uh, kind of relationship and how you know all parties have benefited. Jenny, your comments here. I agree that the the one thing that Karen said was that to to enable and not influence. I think that that is something that it's such a nuance. It's such a subtle. It's such a subtle thing, but it's just so incredibly important. 
Um, and also to your point with, with Stella, yeah, not everyone comes around. And one of the things that you have to learn is who does and who doesn't, who will and who won't. And we never get it right. But at least by having the strong community of like-minded individuals that we are building, it, it helps to, yes. to, I don't helps to hide any sort of the nasties that are looming. <laughs> Uh, well, it's what kind of what uh, someone said on the front end. Uh, we all have to find our tribe. You know, some folks yeah. get it. Some folks don't. Uh, that's yeah. a big part of the journey. So, um, yeah. OK, yeah. I really hate to start to wind things down, but I, I, I definitely want to make sure that folks know how to connect with all of y'all. And I want to start with uh, uh, Karin. Let's start with you. So Karin Perturius, uh, KPI Cubed supply chain consulting and training congrats on those eight years by the way eight years in small mm -hmm. business or a startup or whatever that's like worth um 30 in everywhere else it feels so uh karen how can folks connect with you yeah so um you're welcome to reach out to me on linkedin i'm karen pretorius cscp so for certified supply chain professional on linkedin you're welcome to reach me there or you can reach me via email at karen at k it's K A R E N at KPI three. So for KPI cubed, Karen at KPI three dot co dot za, and you're welcome to reach me through any of those areas. Or my website is www dot KPI three dot co dot za. So welcome to reach me on any of those channels. It's just a, just going to do a quick, just going to do a bit quick bit of translation there. Z A just for those who need to know. Z O Z A Z A. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hey, uh, Jenny, I appreciate you taking care of our uh, multilingual uh, listening <laughs> audience. Thank you very much. I remember the first time I heard Zed, and I'm like, what? I've <laughs> never heard this. Zed is Z. It blew my mind. I, this was just a couple of years ago. Um, but hey, I also want to point out before we go to Stella, um, man, y'all brave individuals, all of y'all and many of our listening audience that are bilingual or trilingual, and you're doing things outside of your, your primary language. I mean, that takes a brave, um, passionate soul that is willing to put themselves out there. And, you know, that often goes under-recognized uh, and, yeah. and unrecognized and underappreciated. So uh, I, I have a lot of appreciation because, as I mentioned, and I'm only kind of halfway kidding, I still struggle with, with my primary language. So, um, <laughs> Stella, let's make sure folks know how to connect. Uh, Stella Shaketa. Uh, your African supply chain podcast, amongst other things. How can folks connect with you to, who knows, have you come in and speak uh, to be on your podcast, uh, compare notes, you name it. Yes, um, you can reach out to me uh, at the podcast YASP, um, your African supply chain podcast on LinkedIn, but it has a good Gen Z. I'm also on the Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so it, yes, it's yes, uh, Y A S C P uh, underscore S J on Instagram. Also, for my personal uh, LinkedIn, Stella Jaqueta, and on also on, uh, Instagram, Stella dot Jaqueta. So you'll see my name, my name and surname. Wonderful. And you know, we're gonna make that real easy. We're gonna drop all those links uh, in the episode notes so folks are one click away. Um, thank you so much to both of our guests, Jenny, no one go anywhere. We're going to, uh, ask Jenny a couple <laughs> of questions as well, but, uh, Karen Pretorius, uh, Stella Shaketa, thank you both so much. And we look forward to having you back on and do an update session, maybe later in the year. Thank you both. All right. So Jenny, man, you brought two incredible people here today. Uh, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the conversation. I wish we had a couple more hours, but I want to make sure folks know um, about the 45th SAPIX annual conference that you and the team are leading. Um, you know, how can folks learn more about that? And, and hey, join us all maybe and attend. Absolutely, 100%. Um, so the conference is the 11th to the 14th of June, and it's in the beautiful um, district or city of, of Cape Town. If you haven't been, you need to come. And I know, Scott, that you are going to be totally converted. Um, I'm particularly excited because Stella and Karen are going to be sharing this story at the conference. You're going to be there. So maybe we can replicate this in IRL in real life. <laughs> 
which, we love which our would acronyms, be very don't exciting. We? we surely do. We surely do. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the event is fantastic. It's been going for 45 years. It is the place where supply chain professionals meet other supply chain professionals in Africa and, and around. And there's something very, very special about being in a room full of people who have exactly the same passion and the same desire to learn. It's really stimulating. It never gets boring. And we're really looking forward to it. We will never take an in-person event for granted ever Mm -hmm. again. Never again. You're so right. And we've all, you know, it's been great to see the world in many ways reconnect in person and IRL, kind of as you put it. And I can't wait to see Stella. And Karen, and of course, Jenny, you and, and your team and all the other folks that, that come in and want to talk um, how we move global supply chain forward and leadership innovation and and a whole bunch more. So uh, Jenny, the website for folks to learn more yeah. is? www.sapix, that's S-A-P-I-C-S dot org, O-R-G, and then dot Z-A. Oh, wonderful. And folks can connect with you on LinkedIn yeah. uh, via that site. Is that how, how would you suggest Yep. LinkedIn is the best. Jenny Froome with an F um, and like room. And I'm there and I'm reasonably responsive. And for the time being, I'm still quite active with my Twitter community. How long for? That's all for another discussion. But Twitter's also good. And it's Jenny Froome. Agreed. Jenny's a great follow there and great connection on LinkedIn. And hey, she's reasonably responsive and that ain't bad. So uh, <laughs> p- uh, folks, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed. Thank you, uh, Jenny. Always a pleasure, Jenny Froome, to have these conversations with you. I really, I, I really admire, you know, this, uh, I've shared this outside of shows. Mm-hmm. I admire your real action driven, uh, serve others type of leadership. So thanks so much, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and for giving us this platform. You Never bet. taken for granted. Uh, it's a really important investment on our, our part. That's how we get to learn from Stella and Karen and everyone else. So, hey, folks, listeners, viewers, you name it. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode as much as I have. I've got my 18 pages of notes. I can't wait to share it uh, with all of y'all and then some. But, hey, enjoy this conversation. Not only find your African Supply Chain podcast wherever you get your podcast from, but you can find Supply Chain Now as well. And, hey, about the second language stuff, uh, check out Supply Chain Now in Espanol as we continue to build – that uh, Spanish language version of our supply chain um, uh, uh, programming. So, but hey, whatever you do, take this information, take these ideas, deeds, not words, put it to action. And on that note, Scott Luton challenging you to do good, to give forward and to be the change. And we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.